why don't we start where we where i always love to start and that is by telling you i was right so uh it's good this is going to be a bit of a twofer because my fans do like it when i spike the football and you know get to do the little victory dance you know that's that, that's what that is and uh, also they like it when i talk about the overwatch league or rather you know there is no overwatch league now what was announced uh, today was i mean pretty much what we've been expecting which is that the saudi arabian state is now taking over the overwatch uh, output which i imagine is going to be it should be deeply problematic for a game that really prided itself on its diversity and inclusion, right? So just in case you didn't know what's been happening, I'll give you a quick preamble, as I always do, because as now that I'm algorithmically approved, everyone's video is poten you know, potentially their first. This could be the first time you've ever heard my opinions on anything, and you might not know the background, so... Basically, in 2017, uh, it was announced they were going to be running this, uh, you know, kind of, well, in 2017 it launched, but prior to that, it, they, they announced, Activision Blizzard announced they were going to run a, basically a manufactured esports league where people were invited to pay $20, 25000000 million to buy in and have a franchise slot uh, under the proviso that Activision Blizzard approved of you and you couldn't use your own branding. Uh, you had to use a branding that was sort of brainstormed by Activision blizzard which is you know why you end up with stuff like you know san francisco shock and london spitfire and all and shanghai dragons or whatever it is and all this other stuff rather than recognize these sports brands now there were many people at the time that said oh look i've been in esports i'm raising my hand because i was one of these people uh, i've been in esports a while guys and uh, let me tell you a few things that don't work class-based shooters really struggle because there's a um, informational overload for the viewer uh, it's just the way it is it's got all the issues of a MOBA, but without the overview that provides at least some nuance. Like on a, you know, on a MOBA, you get uh, you get all these different little explainers, you know, and like you know how these things can work and timers and stuff. You don't have any of that in a first-person shooter because any clutter on the screen, you want as little clutter as possible so you can appreciate the finesse and the skill of the shooting. So you have this informational overload. They generally don't tend to do well as esports, even if they do well as games the other problem of course is regionality regionality is um uh, uh, this issue that we've tried time and time again in esports because people like the idea of traditional stick and ball sports where you know hey i'm from there i'm from london i support the london team can i go to the london stadium i think i will and um obviously uh, that just doesn't work in esports because we're primarily digital and so actually it's very reductive to do uh, regional esports because what you're what you're saying is we're prioritizing essentially people who live in a locale over you being a global brand and i would even go so far as to argue that increasingly stick and ball sports don't even limit themselves to regionality you know if you think about the export of man united or liverpool or arsenal or man city and you think about the tournaments they participate in and the roadshow games where they conduct their pre-season friendlies you know having shops and you know all this like you know in in countries you might not even expect you look at the nfl with the wembley games they've started doing games in germany and you know they're looking to expand across europe to offer that product uh you know it, it, it's actually reductive to sort of just focus on hey you know we're from la so you know yeah, yeah people will turn up and watch your games but you're limiting yourself uh if you don't look beyond your immediate horizons now anyone could have told activision blizzard this some people did tell activision blizzard this some people were very vocal about it and what they got for their troubles were they were uh, blackballed essentially by activision blizzard that's what happened to me um i wasn't allowed uh to I mean, for various criticisms, I criticized them for WCS. I was already in the doghouse. So, you know, um, if you criticize their stupid idea, you were basically on, you were, you were pushed out and blackballed and that was that. Now, anyway, fast forward to this year, well, 2023 rather, um, and it's been confirmed 
that, yes, the league is shutting down. I mean, it sort of went into a death spiral, and ultimately it looked like there was going to be some sort of class action suit from the team owners because they had been sold a bill of goods. There was no way this league could succeed. There was no way this league could do all the things they'd explicitly been told that it, it was going to do. And I've talked about this before, and I will get round to publishing the article. But there was this Morgan Stanley document, which was like a, a document for potential bidders and investors. And it was like really like over the top and how successful it was going to be. The numbers made no sense whatsoever. And so in the end, Activision Blizzard, who are now being taken over by Microsoft, they turned around and said to the owners that we'll give you $6 million back if you, and we'll all just part ways. There was a two, there was a two-thirds majority vote on that, and the majority of owners decided, yeah, actually, $6 million back for this fucking $20 million lemon we bought is probably about as good as it's going to get. So at that point, everyone, everyone in the Overwatch scene was like, oh, what's going to happen to Overwatch? Now that the Overwatch League has died, and there was again one voice that said, oh, I'll tell you what's going to happen uh, immediately, uh, the Saudi Arabians are going to have that. And that was me. Again, I uh, did a number of videos on it. You can go look it up. Uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, state, and to be clear, it is the Saudi Arabian state, are in the process of buying up as many esports properties as they can. And it's not just exclusive to esports. I mean, they are buying up as many intellectual properties as they can. They're buying up entertainment products. They're buying up sports products. They are they are importing footballers. They are doing deals with Messi and Ronaldo to promote their league, which hilariously, and I might get around to writing about this on my website, there's an exodus already. All those players that went over for the bag, they're all leaving. Henderson hacked it for six months. Uh, why is that? Well, many players privately have complained, oh, we brought our wives out and there's all these weird rules. It's like, yeah, imagine that. <laughs> imagine uh, imagine this Saudi Arabian theocracy having strange attitudes towards women. Who could have seen that coming? Anyway, they're still in the process of buying as much as they can, you know, golf, Formula One, you know, investing in Disney, WWE, you know, whatever it is. There was even talks about uh, the, the UFC as well at one point. And it will continue because there's this thing called the 2030 vision for Saudi Arabia. And the 2030 vision is that they want to be completely free of oil dependency for their revenue by 2030. And they believe the best way to do this and remain politically influential is to take this wealth at the moment that they have. And before we get into renewables and green and, uh, you know, electric cars, and all that other stuff they're going to put it into things that will still give them cultural capital as well as being hugely profitable and lucrative uh, you know at a given moment so that's what's happening and esports is such a terrible industry that they've probably looked at it and sort of laughed at how cheap total dominance is going to come because you can buy these esports properties now for a, a few million uh because they've been running to the ground we haven't had at any point a sustainable business model and the fans don't pay for anything and so what's happened now is the saudi arabian state has bought these properties and they're going to underwrite it they're going to underwrite all these projects and these tournaments and this output, and everyone's going to be like, yeah, this is perfectly fine. It's only sustainable until they get bored of doing that or, e or they don't see the value in esports anymore. So, you know, we are, by the way, what we've done to get out of one potential collapse, we have now guaranteed a future collapse. That's what we've done in esports. That's how fucking dumb this industry is now with the overwatch league being up for grabs and the overwatch ip being up for grabs who's going to run the tournaments who's going to carry the boats right said david goggins uh who indeed and uh obviously it's not going to be activision blizzard anymore microsoft didn't ex uh, express a particular interest in doing it and so obviously esl owned by the savvy games group the esl face it group which is owned directly by the saudi arabian public investment fund which is run by the state they have swooped in and they have basically today it's been confirmed done what i said they were going to do and they've made their bid and it's all agreed and they are going to run an overwatch circuit which looks a lot more like an open counter-strike circuit the type of thing you would be used to indeed as we'll show they're gonna have live events at dreamhack now you know so and this is kind of ironic for a few reasons i'm gonna play a video in a moment so i know you're bored of me prattling on but i always think context is important but what's really funny about this well it's, it's funny for two reasons the first is that when the overwatch league 
was put together, Activision Blizzard did reach out to several tournament operators and say, you know, do you want to run some Overwatch tournaments adjacent to ours? Uh, and they said, oh, yeah, it's a hot new game, so why not? And then they they told the tournament operators, okay, but here are the rules. And the rules were, we get to decide all of the graphics you use, right? We So we have Final Vita on that. We need two staff members from Activision Blizzard in your production truck telling you what to do on the broadcast at all times. You're not allowed to use any stats that we don't approve of because we want, we want to have final dominion over what stats dictate success. And on and on and on this long laundry list went of things you had to do to placate Blizzard. And all the tournament operators turned around and went, this is fucking shit. And ultimately it was just, they were so invested in Overwatch being successful, they were even going to potentially hamper and weaken adjacent broadcasts that even though it promoted their game, because they just wanted their broadcast to be the best. Again, another example of how fucking stupid the industry is. Now, they've had to go begging to ESL, who ESL turned them down when that was the deal. So that's funny. And the other reason it's funny is, you know, and I don't use this word often because it's it's passe now and it doesn't really, it, no one can really define it. It's become strange, nebulous term that right I'd screech about. But wasn't Overwatch meant to be this wonderful woke game, right? It was meant to be this woke game where, you know, and, and it got woker by the second because every time, you know, classic rainbow capitalism, every time Activision Blizzard was in a crisis, they just made a character gay. That'll dig us out of the hole. Shit, Bobby Kotick's done what? Right, uh, get uh, get Soldier 76 on the phone. Get, get the voice actor for Soldier 76 on the phone. I need him to say ooh-woo. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, they, they just did this over and over and over again, you know. Uh, get that 3D animator on. We need uh, we need a big throbbing dick uh, <laughs> added to the Soldier 76 uh, porn output. with it, And he's got to be with a guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, it, it's pretty embarrassing. But anyway, it was meant to be this, like, you know, woke game where, you know, and again, woke's such a stupid term for it, where everyone's welcome. And it's like got this, you know, they did all those, like, really saccharine commercials where, where the power of friendship we're all together and basically what they've done is ultimately made a game where you know they've fleshed out characters and they've made many of the characters canonically gay canonically trans canonically non-binary you know whatever it is and uh, that's fine by the way richard richard approves uh, representation does matter no matter what uh, chuds will tell you it, it is important so i have no issue with that i have an issue with the cynical deployment of the gay every time you want to dig yourself out of a hole and look like you're a good person I'm sick of the LGBT community being used uh, by devious fucks, uh, frankly, because really, when 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 the LGBT community does need someone to you know fucking fight for them, uh, a bit of allyship, as they call it in America, these people aren't actually anywhere to be found. But when it's performative and it makes them money, oh yeah, sure, 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 love it. Look, I vomit rainbows, you know, like so whatever. Um, anyway, they've proven themselves to be hypocrites on this front multiple, multiple times because whenever they do one of these like Pride Month, uh, um, you know, kind of promotions and it has to go to Turkey or it has to go to Russia or it has to go to South Korea or it has to go to China, the content's not there. And they've publicly lied and they've publicly said the reason we don't have the content in that region is because we're worried that gay players might accidentally out themselves and put their lives at danger. Yeah, you know, like, it's like, you don't care. You're just a coward. You're a moral coward, and you want to make money. And as we saw the other day on the other stream, you know, you've even got Riot Games. They don't call it Pride. They don't call it the Rainbow. They call it a festival of colors. This is the garbage, the hypocrisy. And so, you know, for Overwatch to say, uh, for Activision Blizzard and o the Overwatch uh, team to say they care about gay rights and gay representation and then now their entire esports circuit is run by the saudi arabian state is pathetic and so um i, I am very intrigued to see what the reaction is going to be from the overwatch community because even though i have a sort of fractious relationship with them you know because i've been stalked and harassed and threatened um i've had Go fuck yourself you old dog shit. Just like that. And, uh, you know, I even had some guy say he was outside my house with a machete over some minor Overwatch beef. And then people were like, Richard, why are you reporting him to the police? Oh, I don't know. 
I don't know. I guess I'm the bad guy, right? So, you know, uh, fuck the Overwatch community. They deserve everything they get. But one thing I will say is, out of all the esports communities that have had to witness their game being taken over by Saudi Arabia, CS, they're just like, huh? Eh. They'll occasionally post about sports washing. They're educated as to the problem, at least, in CS. And they talk about it, but they. But what are you going to do? That's what CS is. Dota, <laughs> it's brilliant. All I care about is having a tournament bigger than TI. I love Saudi me. That's Dota. And, you know, Overwatch, I don't really know. I don't know where the temperature check is going to be on that. It's kind of interesting because we've had people like Sideshow, you know, come out and publicly say, we need to give a shit about this Saudi stuff. He works in Valorant and Overwatch. So we'll see how that pans out. I'm going to give you a little temperature check of the reactions today. Anyway, there we go. We're all up to date. So why don't we watch a video? Enough of Richard. And actually, just before I play the video, a bit of chat interaction. Watch this. Uh, B Tannen AU. By the way, B Tannen AU. So I'm guessing you're an Australian esports fan. So I disregard your opinion on anything ever uh, because you are the most moronic esports fan base. Esports fans are morons. And then it, within that is uh, an enclave of turbo morons. And they all have Australian flags in the name for some reason. I don't know how it happened. You might be able to tell me, but it's true. Um, so anyway, Richard, why do you keep covering the Saudi stuff when it's never going to stop? Now, it's a very good question. Why do I bother? Well, okay, uh, let, let me tell you why. I know that I know two things. I know, first of all, yes, you're right. Nothing I say is going to stop the march of progress and the Saudi Arabian takeover of esports. Equally, I know, I'm actually putting myself, I'm not going to dramatize it, but I have been told by a few people that certain elements are aware of the things I'm saying and they don't like it. So I'm not saying I'm putting myself at risk because that's really overselling what it is. I don't think I'm going to end up in a suitcase, but you know, strange things have happened, but it's not helping my career. It's definitely excluding me from, I can never work an ESL event. I can never work a face event. I can, I mean, I never would anyway. I can never work a riot event, but equally as well. Now there's some games that are developed directly by Saudi that I can never cover. And you know, if I want to be morally concerned, Consistent. I mean, I've had to walk away from my own lifelong football team, Newcastle United, and not buy shirts and not get tickets for the games and not buy pay-per-view matches and not watch, you know, because of the Saudi Arabian takeover. It's a very hard, you know, if you, very hard line to walk, but if you're going to be consistent, you're consistent. And principally, I could have my own company by now with Monty and Thorin. We had funding lined up, and unfortunately, that funding was part of the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund, and I said no, and it was millions. We, we, we would have had a content company and a studio and all that other stuff, uh, and I said no. And that's why, by the way, when people say they can't say no to the money, I did, so I don't know why it's so hard for everybody else but whatever i guess so anyway why do i do it it's because there is a large percentage of the esports audience that aren't really aware of it then first of all they're not aware of just how much saudi arabian money has uh permeated through entertainment sports and esports they don't really know second they also aren't aware of why saudi arabia might be a problem i mean there's a lot of esports fans that aren't very geopolitically aware i think that's putting it nicely right and that's not their fault i wouldn't expect everybody to know these things but I'm going to educate them and make sure they do know these things and then they can make an informed decision one of the things i've always stood for and you know at various points this gets you called right wing left wing fascist nazi wokey sjw you should always know the facts so you can make a decision that makes sense to you i might not agree with the decision but at least you're making an informed one right and that's crucial to a free and egalitarian society and we don't have that right now we don't have that in a lot of ways we don't have that politically 
we don't have that you know the, the media just fucking lies to you and and people make bad decisions based on bad information and i want to try and cut through that as much as possible the other reason is that i alone might not be able to do anything but realistically if enough people do find it distasteful it's gonna hurt the bottom line of the businesses that got in a bed with saudi and that is nominally a good thing that is a good thing it would be good if esl went bust they can't but let's imagine a world three four years down the line where saudi goes yeah we're not really seeing a return and we actually we're gonna focus less on esports now because you know golf's popping off formula one's popping off we just bought darts we bought the premier league or you know we've got teams in that european super league now and we, well, we bought disney you know whatever it's gonna be and they just go this esports thing's kind of whack so we're we're not we're not put, you know put, putting the money in if we get to that point and there are enough people who are actually willing to like boycott and not watch and not you know purchase you know merchandise related to esl and all this other stuff and opt out and it hurts their bottom line and they go under because of it that's a huge victory like we've won a great battle you know so so this is why you have to persist even in the face of innumerable odds and i think of a a a, a quote uh, from a, a, a Buddhist master uh, that said, uh, when asked to move a mountain, do not look at its size, simply pick up the first rock. And with that mindset, you can do things that seem insurmountable. So there's the answer. Right, anyway, on to that video. Right, here we go. Hey friends, long hey, Zoe. time no see. I know myself and probably all of you watching have been eagerly waiting to hear about the new esports program for Overwatch. And guess what? The wait is over. I have two special guests joining me today to share some exciting news about the future. So please welcome Overwatch executive producer Jared News and Overwatch esports product lead Bailey McCann. What's up, you guys? Hello. I just want to dive straight in. Share the news. What's Let's good? What's going on in Overwatch esports? All right, Overwatch 2, as we all know, is a very competitive game. It's fast, it's dynamic, and it's at its best when two closely matched teams are battling it out over control point or fighting over our buddy TS1. It's our goal as a development team to ensure that all of our players get to experience the thrill of competition. Esports competitions are critical to Overwatch. I just love as well that they've included this little bit at the start, and it's like I'm watching it, and I'm like, this is horrible. <laughs> it's You're just watching it, and you're just like, it's going to give me a fucking seizure. How's anyone... How's anyone dealing with this? Like, it's just so bad. Like, and this is what they're like, including in their own video to showcase how good Overwatch is. It's a fucking neon nightmare. It's just so insane, but whatever. Too. They give us an opportunity to celebrate the best Overwatch players in the world and to showcase their skills. As we've been listening to our community about everyone's thoughts on Overwatch esports, we've tailored a vision for what we want our new ecosystem and premier circuit to look like with these underlying principles. First is open competition. Anyone who wants to get involved and compete in Overwatch Esports, they should just be able to jump in, with any five players able to make a team and make it all the way to the top of Overwatch Esports without any barriers in their way. Now, I'm glad they've reiterated this as being their vision statement, because uh, let me tell you, that was not their mission statement. Uh, somewhat hilariously, when they first conceived of the League, and I've told this story before but you, you know now that i'm algorithmically approved maybe someone will clip this and go oh wow i had no idea the original plan for the overwatch league by the way was to incorporate some type of draft system so like what they do in collegiate sports that basically every year teams orgs were going to get to choose it you know in in a sequential order what talent they brought into their teams and that was how transfers were essentially going to operate and, and by the way they were telling people this and they were telling people if you have an overwatch team now and we'd rather you didn't and wait to the league but if you do have one please don't lock them into long-term contracts that's what they were being told just have them on short-term contracts because when the league starts we might want to be able to draft those players now in the end that draft uh, never occurred, That the, the draft idea, because if you want to do a collegiate-style draft in American sports, you have to have a ton of things, like a player association and all that stuff. And Activision Blizzard didn't want to do any of that. They didn't want to... Whoa, 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 whoa. We've, so if we're going to draft players, there has to be, like, some architecture around that for, like, 
player rights and bargaining power. Oh, okay, well, nah, fuck that then. And that that's why uh, they didn't do that. And then the other funny part was, how can you say you want your league to be open to everyone when you have an exclusivity closed franchise league where, you know, you never promoted your grassroots game you never, you didn't even tweet about it after the time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you can say that because you would have had an open circuit if you genuinely believed you wanted your game to be for everybody and everybody could compete. But they didn't do that at all. So uh, it's interesting they're going this way now. We've heard lots and lots of feedback about how long the off seasons can be and how the lack of anything to play for and watch can make coming back to competitive Overwatch esports even harder. Mm. So we're looking to support meaningful competition that is always going to be happening for our players and fans. Next is a regional focus. We recognize that players across the globe have different preferences and there is truly no one size fits all solution for Overwatch esports. So we've designed our new program with some regional partners who can expertly tailor the experience across each individual region. It's crucial that we support a premier circuit to celebrate the pinnacle of Overwatch esports competition. However, we understand that this competition necessarily doesn't always reach all of our players. With our new ecosystem, we're excited to support a few unique programs that will have opportunities with tailored experiences for players of all levels to get involved with. We're happy to introduce the new premier competitive circuit that we've just spoke so much about. So again, uh, we're moving away from this like global, you know, kind of uh, idea that they had where they wanted to do this insane schedule where people would fly to China to compete, you know, from America and then they would fly to Europe and, and, and everyone would be zigzagging all around. And now they've accepted, oh, we're just going to compartmentalize into regions and maybe have the best teams from those region uh, sort of ascend into it. And by the way, when you look at the uh, circuit, I'm going to show you. Now. Champions series. Uh, Let's you, take a look. The OWCS, it's now being called. <laughs> Weebs out, hold up signs. <laughs> And here we go. Uh, wow, the Overwatch Champion Series yes. on WCS. I love the sound of that. So let's dive into this. What details can you share about the OWCS? The OWCS is the premier international competitive Overwatch circuit. We're going to have three regions of competitions that are open to players across North America, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa, or EMEA, and Asia. Each region's competition is going to contain multiple open qualifiers and regional tournaments. Huh. These regional tournaments will determine the top teams in each of our regions uh. that will be competing at our two live events that we'll be having. All right, now just have a look at that structure, guys. <laughs> ah, isn't that crazy? That's crazy, man. That's crazy. I've never seen never seen that ridiculous so yeah it's essentially i mean you know it's appropriate it's being run by esl you've they've essentially taken the counter-strike uh way of doing things uh as it as it is at the moment with the two majors repurposed one as kind of like a global finals and that's kind of like what you're looking at very very similar to cs and yes yeah, similar as well to league of legends in a way uh not directly because of how they do splits and that kind of thing but um the bottom line is could have been doing this in 2017 guys a particularly handsome bald guy told you about that and you didn't listen you did a f clusterfuck of a league and now you're desperately scrambling trying to recapture the imagination of overwatch now sadly in fucking game terms this is now because it's like six seven years old like it's it's a bit of a boomer game now you know and uh i don't know if you're going to be able to have the widespread success you would have had if you'd started this way but we'll see uh so anyway on it goes i think they're going to talk the year that will be bringing the best players in the world together to compete mm. so how exactly will this work for each of those regions for na and emea we will support four regional tournaments that are each going to have their own online open qualifiers 
Each of these open <laughs> qualifiers will be advancing teams to these regional tournaments where teams are going to battle it out and ultimately determine who is qualifying for the two international events that we'll be hosting throughout the year. We're super excited that the qualifiers will all be run through FaceIt. FaceIt is going to be the connection to the esports oh. circuit that will provide players in the community a clearly defined and streamlined that's face it, is it? Oh, yeah, face it. Owned by the Savvy Games Group, owned by the Saudi Arabian state. Yeah, all right then. Yeah, it's face it. Yeah, yeah. weird, didn't it? Weird. By the way, what this is now the, the the entirety of Overwatch is now run by them. All of it. <laughs> so, you know, there's no no alternatives. Competitive experience. And for the Asia region, we will have three subregions: mm. Korea, Japan, and Pacific. Each of these subregions will host multiple regional tournaments catered to each local audience. Each of these regional tournaments will be hosting open online qualifiers through WarGG, which will then lead to their respective sub-regional championships. The best of each of those three subregions will qualify for live events at WDG Esports Studio in South Korea. There, teams can battle it out to earn the right to represent the Asia region at our two international LAN events. The key goal we had while creating the IWCS was to have an inter now, I do wonder that they haven't mentioned this yet, but I do wonder if the major that they have will, or, or maybe even the finals themselves, that those t events will take place in Riyadh. They've not mentioned that yet, but given <laughs> how Riyadh are wanting to bring even like League of Legends in, you know, which has been a hermetically sealed esport for a while, I, I find it hard to believe that one of these international events, particularly as they're being run by the Savvy Games Group, won't take place in Riyadh. And then much like the story I ran the other day with the Riot Games internal dialogue about, no, 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 it's a good thing actually, because we'd have like a gay character in... Uh, on screen and that like represents gays and stuff so yeah it's it's good we're doing this with this regime that executes and persecutes gay people yeah it's good um you're gonna hear that from activision blizzard executives in the coming months uh so again remember i told you so it's also predictable at this point uh another point as well you're gonna notice uh, a little uh, you notice a little something when we did the asia group in fact I'll, I'll just go back they refer to it as asia and then when you look at the asia regions you see korea okay yeah korea's korea's in asia japan yeah yeah J japan's in asia pacific oh, okay yeah. the, the 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 that it feels like it feels like there's a big country just not mentioned at the moment right now. I guess we'll have to call fucking Blue's Clues to figure out uh, who it is. You know, it's only the single largest esports market in the world. And of course, yes, it's, uh, yeah, it is Tibet. <laughs> it's Taiwan. No, um, it's China, of course. Um, and uh, obviously, there is this ongoing problem that hasn't been resolved yet in china which is they fucked it up they you know some unnamed executive that a net ease executive called a jerk in a in in a uh, uh i believe it was it was either a linkedin or a uh, weibo post anyway someone fucked up the deal to the point where now activision blizzard games don't have an official distributor in china and so net ease who had been with them for, I want to say it was like 17, 19 years, it was a long, long time. They ended up, you know, getting rid of that deal. And then because Chinese executives pretty much march in lockstep and show solidarity to one another because NetEase were disrespected in their eyes, nobody else ponied up. Nobody wanted to do it. I don't even know if the fact that they're on Steam now. I don't know if they're on Steam China. I haven't looked into it. But for those who don't know, there's only about 60 games <laughs> on Steam China. Yeah, because they have to be approved by the government. And they've got this like weird ministry of like, it's like the ministry of like youth and culture or something. But I don't think they're on Steam China. So the game is essentially, you know, functionally banned in China, which was a huge part of of the league's direction indeed net ease themselves owned a fucking slot in the overwatch league that's how badly activision blizzard in the bobby kotick era fucked up it is insane 
how bad they fucked it up. And it's hilarious because I'd say don't do business in China because of the genocide of the Uyghur Muslims, l putting people literally in internment camps in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, literally making them pick cotton, literally sterilizing women, literally giving women to business executives as gifts as if they were fucking, you know, cattle, right? Uh, all of that happening. Very good reasons not to do business, business with the Chinese government. But instead, they just didn't do uh, business with China because they were rude and fucked it up. Um, so anyway, no China to be found uh, anywhere in the this announcement. As you can see from the calendar, they'll have two regional tournaments throughout the year where the best teams in each sub-region fight their way to the top compete at a regional LAN event at WDG Studio, and ultimately qualify for international events. International events. I know everyone loves the sound of that. Uh, yeah, we what do. What else can you share about those international events? We'll have two live international events bringing together the best teams from across our three major regions, of yeah. NA, EMEA, and Asia. The first of those international events will be our major in the middle of our season in the summer, and the second will be our season finals that will be happening in the fall. It seems like there's going to be so much to play in and play for. I couldn't agree more. And honestly, when looking at everything that we're going to be having on our roadmap, it really starts to set in stone how many just awesome and incredible competitive Overwatch opportunities that we'll have this year. Between OWCS, our premier international circuit, and all of the other programs, both returning and spinning up, we're just really excited about this new direction for Overwatch esports, as we're able to now give people of all skill levels something to play, watch, and look forward to. Oh, sorry. I also think we should talk about where all this competition is going to be held. Uh, well, yes, please, yes, Jared, please. chair. So the first international event that Bailey was talking about will be our mid-season major hosted at DreamHack Dallas. We're incredibly excited to bring Overwatch Esports to a stage like DreamHack, where some of the most passionate fans of the industry will be attending. What's even better is that our season finals this year will be taking the best teams from each of our OWCS regions to Europe. We know that fans of the European competitive Overwatch community have been clamoring for their own LAN event, and we are so stoked to bring it to them at DreamHack Stockholm in November. All of these international and regional tournaments are all going to And yes, just in case you, you don't know, but you do know, but just in case you don't, DreamHack, also owned by ESL, Face It Group, Savvy Games Group, and by extension, the Saudi Arabian state. Dallas makes total sense. Uh, to do the first uh, Overwatch live event. Obviously, Dallas Fuel, prominent uh, Overwatch team. And when they had a uh, homestand event in Dallas, they remember they were bragging about selling out 10,000 tickets or whatever, even though it was like two days of 5,000, all of that stuff. And they were giving tickets away in a fucking Best Buy around the corner, where if you bought a candy bar, you got a free fucking ticket to the Overwatch event. But, you know, whatever. Uh, the, the Dallas had a, a pretty good base of Overwatch fans. And uh, DreamHack Dallas did pretty well. You know, out of the NA events, you know, I think to like uh, when that DreamHack event was in Vegas, for example, and the crowd was fucking dead, Dallas has done pretty well for, uh, for a crowd uh, in the past. So, you know, it makes sense. Uh, no issues with that. As I said... I don't know if there's going to be a Riyadh event in future. It would make sense. But maybe they're just easing into the fucking sports washing thing gently. I have double elimination brackets. So we can get ready for some chaotic <laughs> loser bracket runs. I know a lot of Wow, double elim. Uh, this is also <laughs> The best esports e format e ever. Overwatch e Again, everyone told is you there this. anything else you guys would like to say to the people watching? I'm so happy to be able to share all the new and awesome opportunities that are coming for fans in the Overwatch esports community. And also, you won't have to actually wait long if you want to play or watch. We'll be kicking off the first OWCS qualifiers right after our Calling All Heroes Championship concludes with competition starting in March. And I'd like to thank everyone who's worked so hard to bring the OWCS to life. This truly has been a passion project for so many of us who care deeply about Overwatch esports and who- Mate, in that case, right, <laughs> fucking, <laughs> instead of thanking all the people who brought this system to life, when you were told this system would have worked, in 2017 by people with brains who understand esports why didn't you fucking thank those guys why didn't you listen and do it and then thank them for saving you hundreds of fucking millions why did the people who 
bought into this bullshit and spent tens of millions of dollars. Why didn't they listen? Because as I've said before, I had people literally calling me up from sports investment groups and having meetings with me because I was working at E-League at the time and I was out in America and they were asking me, like, what do you think about this Overwatch League? Because, you know, we heard you said a few things publicly about it and I was telling them straight, you'll never see a return on that. Never. It is doomed to fail. It will probably fail in three years. And of course, they made it to like fucking five, essentially, or whatever. So Richard Lewis was wrong. Well, no, I fucking wasn't. Uh, the pandemic propped you up for two years, essentially, because you repurposed the failing model to being online and it dragged out your lifespan. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. The Nostradamus of fucking, you know, esports. But I couldn't predict the global pandemic and fucking lockdown. Uh, I was, you know, my bad. Anyway, if you're going to thank people, why not be critical? Like, in all this video and in all the messaging from Activision Blizzard, there's no acknowledgement of failure. Games developers never fail, do they? They never fail. Isn't it incredible how they never fail? They only succeed. I'd like to see, not a mea culpa, you don't have to, like, really overdo it, but I'd like to see a Blizzard executive come out and say why the Overwatch League failed and what we fucked up. That'd be good. But instead, you're just pretending the Overwatch League never happened and OWCS is like this cool new thing and not something that's actually rising from the ashes of an abject failure. One of the biggest failures in esports history, by the way. We want to see the community grow and thrive. I know we're going to see some incredible competition this year and I can't wait for March to get here. Neither can I. Not going to speak on behalf of everyone. Neither can they. The future is bright. We have so much to look forward to. Thank you both so much for coming here today and share the great news with everyone watching. So with that said, that's it from us. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will be seeing all of you very soon. Bye, Zoe. You're still too good for Overwatch. So there you go. And, um, you know, it's all... It's all been confirmed. That's what the future looks like. And, you know, that's how it's going to be. I'll still watch this space around Overwatch events at Riyadh. Remember as well, Overwatch is having a sort of cultural impact uh, over there because Saudi Arabia won the Overwatch World Cup. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I, I can't imagine that there's not going to be some Overwatch event in Riyadh in the near future. Uh, so anyway, there we go. That's uh, what's happening with Overwatch. Uh, it has fallen into Saudi hands like so much of esports has. And let's check in with the fans. How have they reacted to it, do you think? Now, listen, the competitive Overwatch subreddit is a sewer. It could always be... The finest minds. Let's see how they've taken it. Let's see if there's any mention of the dreaded Saudi Arabian takeover. We'll jump into the first Reddit thread. There's two Reddit threads about this. And we'll scan it. We'll scan it for Saudi uh, descent. Let's see if there is any. Uh, no, nothing there at the top comment. Plat Chat has content to look forward to. Plat Chat, by the way, is uh, the podcast with, um, with Sideshow. Um, who has obviously spoken out about Saudi. I don't know if they're alluding to that. They've introduced two non-resident player rule. People enjoy that. Uh, this is pretty sweet. Open for everyone at all levels. Someone complaining about South America. I'm guessing it's the, does this happen because we are Brazilian? They will never understand. Why do they shut down the South American servers? Uh, what is this feeling? Optimism. Face it, that's crazy. What is face it? There you go. Men uh, one mention of Saudi. Not critical. Sports washing. We did it. Nightmare for you. It's the first person in the thread. Continued sports washing by Overwatch now. Don't know how I feel about that. I don't like it, but it's becoming common and unavoidable. Uh, I'm so curious to see if all the I won't watch anything with Saudi in it are going to follow through or will it be, oh, it doesn't count because the face of who's organizing it is American. Certainly interesting. Can't say I'm stoked about face it being involved. We're so back. This is insanely hype. No China, but still a good start. I'd say no China might, might be the best start. Uh, still no, no. We're back. We're so back. We're so back. Rip Bozo. He got his meme wrong there. 
Yeah, he does have Overwatch in his username, so, you know. Good changes. It was Jova, but now it has Bajun. Here we go. Saudi Arabia's investment fund running things in almost every major region, every region is still a major L. But, okay, good. We're standing on our principles here. They are eight years too late in implementing this. That's one of my burners, obviously. We are so back. Let's fucking go. They did something. I'm still bitter and sad that the Overwatch League dream is dead. It was dead on uh, arrival. Face it, aka Saudi Investment Fund, by the way. And then that got minus. That's been downvoted. That's minus one. Has any game in the history of esports had a scene that survived after an official league gets closed? I mean, yeah. Uh, we're so back. We're so back. 512 teams. My time has come. Yep. Not really a lot of resistance, is there? You know, you would have thought there'd be a bit more, given that, you know, maybe Abby Tracer. They're not going to be showing those Tracer cartoons in Saudi Arabia. I'll tell you that for free. I mean, I don't know if you saw it, by the way. It's totally unrelated to the video, but it's banter. They got rid of Tracer's ass. Don't know if you saw this. It's like fucking ironing board now. They were that worried about the male gaze, I guess. They just did this, so... Tough time, tough time. <laughs> tough time to be Tracer. Caught up in the Gyata cost and uh, obviously not even allowed to be the canonic, canonic lesbian she is in the country that's now running the whole game. Tough times. Anyway, uh, let's have a look at this other thread real quick. Pro talent coming from Korea. This is interesting. Streamed on one platform. Looks decent. These comments are reacting to the blog post, which largely says what was in the video I showed you. Booking my flights to Stockholm. Done some digging. We're so back. We are back. What about Australia? Lol. Get fucked, I guess. Uh, and there it is. No, not a single. So we, we only had... We only had the word sports washing used once across two threads about this announcement. And that's just how they get you. You either get bored of it, uh, or you aren't aware of it, or you just go along with it. Or you get caught up with all the fucking bot accounts and shills saying, but what about the US? What about the US? What about the US? And it's like the US government isn't running these esports events. What about the US? <laughs> and then you do that. Now, I will say, there was a thread relinking to the uh, sideshow video that i've told you guys about which is as you can see there he's looking wonderful as always a beautiful man with a beautiful mustache a mustache i'm envious of uh but e e egg to egg I, I i do appreciate him um and you can see there it's on the thumbnail it's the saudi arabian flag uh with uh, the words money for silence and that is indeed another big part of the sports washing paradigm that video is great if you've not watched it. I've recommended it a few times. Recommended it on stream. Recommended it in the Esports Gospel podcast. But you can uh, certainly go and check it out if you haven't. And it says, look, with the recent news, this video by Sideshow is very uh, Im important. Now, the level of discourse in the Overwatch community isn't great. Because obviously the top comment there in this very serious topic about sports washing is, the dude is looking like Dr. Robonic from Sonic. And he didn't even spell Robotnik right. But anyway... ESL face it isn't our savior. It's a new corporate overlord and an ethical downfall. Okay, cool. Huge respect for Sideshow. It could literally make a video like this. It could cost him his job, certainly. And you can see here, people people come into like, the realization. ESL got bought by the Saudi Arabian government. And ESL is in control of this whole thing, basically. That sucks. Again, that's demonstrative of why I keep talking about it. A lot of fans don't know these things. They just watch the games. They're really uninvolved. This is why I won't be watching any of the circuits put on by ESL. I might still love Overwatch Esports, but I'm not supporting an organization owned by a government that would literally stone me to death for having sex with another woman. Cool story, bro. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Like, it's clearly, it's clearly a woman saying I'd be stoned to death if I had sex with a woman because they would stone me to death for gay sex. And the guy's got a cool story, bro. Like, what fucking get... <laughs> get me out. Yeah, I am noticing this. I am noticing this with the Zoomers, actually. Bro is becoming gender neutral. I have noticed that. Like, bro! I, I, but still, 
It's, it is ridiculous. So, cool story, bro. I'll watch OWCS for Overwatch and nothing else. I mean, it's it's not going to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Overwatch Championship Series. So, yeah, okay. I mentioned Face It is owned by the Saudis and someone hacked my Reddit account and changed my profile banner to Saudi players. Um, okay. Wasn't this posted with the exact same title a week ago? So, and now we're starting to get into the we we don't care. Blizzard doesn't care. They were in bed with China forever, so this is really no different. I mean, it wasn't the Chinese government specifically. Who cares? Not interested. Just want to have fun. Now we're getting down to it. Now we're getting... When you consider this is like... You know, this is like a solid chunk of the player base's opinion. Who cares? Not interested. Just want to have fun. We all hate Chainsaw Man. But who cares? Uh, let me watch some fucking Overwatch. This smells like racism. That's the other way they insulate themselves. I look forward to his vids about China and the USA or even NATO next. Well, I look forward to attending the NATO Counter-Strike Championships. That'll be fucking good, won't it? So you can see, unfortunately, this is what I've said uh, for, a, for a long time. Uh, the sports washing stuff works because it, it works either by wearing you down, it works by appearing uh, unfair or overly critical when you talk about the Saudi Arabian stuff. It works because they're buying things you want to participate in, but to participate is on some level complicity, so they lock you into this jewel in your mind about am i gonna do it am i not gonna do it and that's what and and, and that's what you end up reading and that's what the average fan ends up thinking and that unfortunately that type of sentiment is really poisonous it, it spreads people get worn down they get tired of arguing about it and they relent and they just go along with what everyone else does and what everyone else says so yeah uh there we are the future of overwatch is saudi